testimonies from the direct victim. Um, so much is happening in our home, and there's an effort to break us, to make us believe, and to make the people of Uganda believe that there's no option. However, one of our tactics of fighting back has been exposure, especially internationally. It is great to be here in South Africa because some 30 years or more ago, South Africans came to Uganda, the likes of Ramaphosa, the likes of Zuma, they were training in Uganda and many other parts of Africa because Africa was standing in solidarity with South Africa. Now recently, General Seven was here, a known dictator, a known human rights violator, and he was given a hero's welcome in South Africa. I'm very glad, and I salute FNF for giving us the opportunity to come and highlight our plight here in South Africa, because exposure is all that we have. The effort that we have in this film it is the effort that we are putting to make sure that the direct victims of the seven atrocities speak to the world, and I cannot thank FNF enough for that. Thank you for that, Fabian. I think, you know, as we also think about what geopolitics and the role that it plays in the multipolarity of what our politics has brought us, uh, even at this time, um, you are leading a march on Tuesday um, with the leadership of the Gauteng diaspora. And this is speaking to a couple of developments which have materialized over the last couple of months and weeks. Do you want to take us through some of that and, and the reason why even the activism abroad and this exposure abroad really has to magnify and amplify this story? Thank you. I must reiterate that what you saw in the film and what you've heard these uh, witnesses speak is just a scratch on the surface of what is happening back home. If I was to parade victims of human rights violation, this hall would be filled with only victims and that would still be a scratch on the surface. Um, there was organized, I'm not sure whether it's still going on uh, given the public holiday uh, that's happening uh, on Sunday, but we reach out to the people of South Africa, most importantly Ugandans living here, to remind them that they have a role the marches, the demonstrations, the social media protests, the reach outs, the screenings like this one, play a huge role in changing things back home. Dictators only fear the international community, and South Africa is part of the international community. Much as the biggest part of the international community loves to pretend that everything is normal in Uganda, much as the biggest part of the international community prefers diplomacy to democracy, they prefer business to human rights. We want to put it in their face to remind them that by standing with a dictator in Uganda, they are actually sponsoring our oppression, including South Africa. And if we thank you, and if we create enough awareness, maybe they will be ashamed of supporting the dictatorship. Maybe they will remember that once upon a time they came to Uganda to fight against oppression, and now they should be ashamed for sponsoring oppression back in Uganda. Indeed, um, indeed, uh, Bobby. You know, on that note, I think, you know, there's been so many interviews, we've done a lot of short films, and of course this being one of the biggest. And a lot has been said, and I think we all are part of a social media community. We read very widely. What happens now? Now that we know what happens, we know what's been happening, it's in our faces. We saw you know, a campaign happening for the 2021 elections where the NRA was allowed to just do business as usual and there were people alongside him. But then one wonders, um, is the country divided in its, in its ideas around the regime? Or will there be a time when people actually say enough is enough? It is true the country is divided between oppressors and the oppressed, between those that are eating and those that are being eaten, between those, a small group of people that took our country hostage and the mass population that is yearning for change, 
that is yearning for dignity. A huge youthful population that wants to take charge of its destiny, that wants to define itself. Yes, the country is divided. But again, uh, when you ask what next now, we are just not going to give up. Because South Africa is an example that oppressed people cannot be oppressed forever. History teaches us that people who don't give up eventually win. Abani Mirako, Beba Marako. So we keep going. We keep going. Okay, what's going to be like slightly? Um, you know, the politics, as we talk about Jesus' people, for the people, with the people, and by the people, there are definitely other people who are by your side all the time, and that is your family. And we witnessed in this um, documentary some very heartening and very emotive moments between you and your children and, and Bobby, who we also fondly is your wife, Barbara Chagodani. Um, tell us a bit about what that looks like for the kids. I mean, they've had to have their lives destabilized at some point, and I'm sure this still happens quite regularly. But what about on the family side? Ah, it is hard with my family, real hard. I worked so hard as a young man with my wife, and we had promised each other that at 35, we're going to retire and just chill. <laughs> and at 35, I started something that I don't know where it's even going to end. <laughs> so it was tough, but at least my wife and I are best friends and we understand each other. Again, we have our children that we had decided initially to keep ignorant about this. We kept to either lying to them or not telling them. But every time they went to school, their friends were telling them, oh, your dad has been in prison, or oh, your dad is a wanted man, or your dad is a criminal. So we decided to open up to our children. Now, our children know the truth. They know everything. It's unfortunate that they had to grow up before their time, but it was the only way out. And they understand us, they support us, they sacrifice with us. The only group of people that I feel so indebted to, and I salute them so much, are my friends, my old friends, who did not have to go into this. But when I say, guys, now my spirit is telling me to fight for my country. They say, is that why you're going, buddy? I said, yeah, they said, we are coming you. you. And those friends are still standing with us, the likes of Ali, the likes of uh, Igbo, the likes of Kami. They did not have to get into this, but they understood alongside myself that our country is all that we have, and we are all that our country has. So we went to do it. The pearl of Africa indeed, with many pearls in the country. Um, if I could please ask Kelly and Petunia, uh, to please get the roving mics. I would like to invite the audience now to please have your say at this point in time to uh, speak to Bobby and pose your questions from the movie uh, or in general if there's anything that you wish to, to get off your chest. While we get that set up, so we'll take a first round and a second round and I'll just get an indication by way of hands and my, my colleagues assisting me with that. But maybe just as a, as, a, as a leading question into this, I mean, we have many people in the audience from the diaspora to other NGOs, as well as people who are human, who are working in international law, who are even just lawyers and interested people, who have children here as well. So it is a difficult to to take questions. I want to maybe ask you, as, as, as I hope you can get some, some, some hands going, do you think Ugandans are conscientized about constitutionalism in Uganda? And at which point they can actually recognize, or well, I suppose the division then can be addressed if they, do you actually understand what is happening? Or are certain things being whitewashed? Ugandans definitely understand. They're so politically cautious. They understand and they appreciate where they are.